What's up all you quantum maniacs? You were wondering where I went? Well, we started a new channel called The Main Eventer, focused on dope WWE content. So make sure you all go subscribe and turn on notifications over there. There'll be a link down below in the description and the pinned comment. But if you want to see more of me back on TPS, show me some love. Let's get this video to 2,000 likes. Remembering the most violent NFL game ever played. Now every football game that has ever been played has been violent, but some games are more violent than others. And today, given everything we know about concussions and CTE, the NFL is doing everything it can to make the game less violent. Every year, the league introduces new rules aimed at reducing the risk of serious injuries. But things were very different 30 years ago. They was out here dying. Back then, nobody cared about concussions, and teams actually hit injuries from players. Back then, guys told trainers to tape up broken legs and amputate mangled fingers so they could get back in the game. Back then, the more violence you had in a football game, the better it was. And no game in the history of the National Football League featured more bone-crushing, ligament-popping, brain-rattling violence than the epic showdown between the Los Angeles Raiders and the Chicago Bears on November 4th, 1984. By all accounts, that game, a heavyweight battle between two teams stacked with pro bowlers, all pros, and future Hall of Famers, was the most vicious contest anybody had ever seen. It pitted the defending Super Bowl champions against a group of brash and up-and-comers, and it was filled with dirty hits, catastrophic injuries, and even death threats. Just halfway through the game, one career was destroyed and players were flat out refusing to go into the game. So today, we're gonna take a look at what it was like to play in that game. But to start things off, we've gotta provide you with a little bit of background. Let's start with the LA Raiders. They came to Chicago for their Week 10 game against the Bears with a record of 7-2. The previous season, they won a championship in historic fashion, outscoring their playoff opponents by a combined 106-33 margin and thrashed the Washington Redskins 38-9 in Super Bowl 18. The Raiders lost their number one quarterback, Jim Plunkett, to injury in Week 6. However, they were confident that Plunkett's heir 27-year-old Mark Wilson was ready to step in, and their roster was still stacked everywhere else. On offense, the Raiders still had Hall of Fame running back and Super Bowl 18 MVP Marcus Allen, not to mention five-time Pro Bowl tight end Ty Christensen. On defense, they were even deeper. The star of the Raiders' defensive line was future Hall of Famer Howie Long, plus up-and-comers Greg Townsend and Sean Jones. At linebacker, the Raiders had all-pro Rod Martin. At safety, they had Pro Bowler Van McElroy. And at cornerback, they had five-time Pro Bowler Lester Hayes and Hall of Famer Mike Haynes, arguably the best backfield duo of all time. By the end of the 1984 season, the Raiders' defense was third in the NFL in yards allowed, fourth in points allowed, and fourth in sacks. Meanwhile, despite missing their top quarterback, the offense was a respectable ninth in points scored. In short, this was not a team to be trifled with. The Raiders had a reputation for attacking and pounding opponents into the ground, and they knew how to win. The Chicago Bears, on the other hand, had a reputation for mediocrity. Prior to the 1984 season, the Bears had gone four straight seasons without making the playoffs. However, the seed of their future success had already been planted in 1978 when owner George Hallis hired Buddy Ryan to be the team's defensive coordinator. Upon joining the Bears, Ryan began working on a new defensive set intended to disrupt and overwhelm the classic pro-style offense most NFL teams were using in the 1980s. Ryan's defense put eight players in the box. Six of those eight were right on the line, four defensive linemen and two linebackers. The other two, a linebacker and a safety, were right behind the line. The idea was to put as much pressure as possible on the opposing quarterback every single play. At first, the 46 defense wasn't all that effective. Like any defensive scheme, it was only as good as the players running it. But by 1984, the Bears finally had the roster to pull it off. The centerpiece of the Bears' defense that year was a trio of future Hall of Famers. Linebacker Mike Singletary, defensive tackle Dan Hampton, and defensive end Richard Dent. They were joined by five other players who would make Pro Bowl appearances at some point in their careers, including tackle Steve Mongo McMichael, linebacker Todd Bell, defensive back Gary Finnick, and linebacker Otis Wilson. With all the pieces in place, the Chicago Bears defense dominated the league in 1984 in a way few teams ever had. They were first in the NFL in yards allowed, third in points allowed, and they set an NFL record with 72 sacks. Heading into their Week 10 showdown against the defending Super Bowl champs, the Bears were 6-3. 
They were the upstarts who had everything to prove. And prove it, they did. On paper, the Chicago Bears' 17-6 victory over the Los Angeles Raiders on November 4th, 1984, may not seem that lopsided. 11 points is just a field goal and touchdown and a two-point conversion. But the final score doesn't tell the story. This game was absolutely insane. The Bears recorded nine sacks, forced three interceptions, and two fumbles. Three quarterbacks were seriously injured, two for the Raiders and one for the Bears. At one point, Raiders defensive end Howie Long told Bears guard Kurt Becker that he was gonna get him in the parking lot after the game and beat him up in front of his family. Long later explained that he was pissed off that Becker had spent the entire game dishing out late hits to Raiders defensive players, one of which had left Long with a sprained back. But a sprained back was nothing compared to what Raiders quarterback Mark Wilson went through that day. He had to leave the game twice before halftime. Wilson's first injury came on a bone-crushing sack by the Bears' Otis Wilson midway through the first quarter. NBC color commentator Merlin Olsen, who was working without the aid of a sideline reporter, described the injury as whiplash, but it definitely wasn't whiplash. In reality, Wilson had smashed his head on the Soldier Field AstroTurf, which was hard as a rock. Footage of Wilson pacing around on the sidelines with a confused look on his face suggests he almost certainly suffered a concussion. If this was 2018, Wilson would have gone into concussion protocol and his day would have been over. But this was 1984. Also, NBC's Dick Enberg explained to the fans watching at home that David Hum, the Raiders' backup quarterback that day, had spent the first half of the season playing golf in Las Vegas. So, Wilson sat out just two series before he went back in. In the second quarter, Wilson was knocked out the game for a second time when he smashed his hand on another player's helmet as he followed through on a throw. That forced the Raiders to put Hum into the game again. And he did not last long. While Wilson was in the locker room getting an x-ray on his thumb, David Hum, who had already had a couple of teeth knocked out that day, took a filthy blindside hit to the knees from Bears linebacker Otis Wilson with just under two minutes left in the second quarter. Hum. Shot puts that one to Christensen incomplete. And Hum is down and writhing again. He is hurt. He is hurt. Hum's knee was absolutely mangled. The 32-year-old never played in the NFL again. As Hum lay on the ground writhing in pain, the NBC cameras cut over to veteran punter Ray Guy on the Raiders sideline. Guy supposedly had a cannon for an arm and was listed as the Raiders' emergency third-string quarterback. NBC showed Guy having a lengthy conversation with Raiders coach Tom Flores. According to Mark Wilson, Flores was asking Guy to go into the game, but Guy flat out refused. At that point, nobody knew who was gonna play quarterback for the Raiders. And when the two teams returned to the field after halftime, NBC ran a graphic showing the second half lineups. And at quarterback for the Raiders, they just put up a bunch of question marks. In the end, Mark Wilson returned to the game with a broken thumb. Of course, he didn't know he had a broken thumb at the time because the Raiders wouldn't tell him. Wilson only learned about the extent of his injury after the game on the flight back to LA. Despite being unable to grip the ball at anything close to full strength, Wilson actually went 4 for 11 in the second half. Even more impressive, he managed to get through the rest of the game without suffering any more injuries. Bears quarterback Jim McMahon wasn't so lucky. After getting battered and bruised throughout the first half, the Raiders were out for revenge. And they got it when defensive lineman Bill Pykel delivered a cheap shot to McMahon long after he handed the ball off on the final play before halftime. At first, nobody at home or in the broadcast booth even realized McMahon had been injured by the hit from Pykel. But then, McMahon came out of the game after running just two plays in the second half, and NBC cameras spotted him wincing in pain on the sidelines. Hilariously, Merlin Olsen speculated that McMahon was suffering from the same kind of whiplash Mark Wilson had experienced earlier in the game. Apparently, Olsen just thought everything was whiplash. However, a few minutes later, Dick Enberg reported that McMahon was leaving the game with a bruised back. In reality, McMahon's injury was much more serious. In Rich Cohen's 2013 book, Monsters, the 1985 Chicago Bears and the Wild Heart of Football, Steve Zucker, McMahon's agent at the time, said he went down to the Bears locker room at halftime to check on his client. He found McMahon standing at a toilet, still in his pads, pissing blood. Once again, if this game were being played in 2018, that would have been it for McMahon. But again, this was 1984. So after pissing blood in the locker room at halftime, McMahon went back out there and tried to tough it out. 
Eventually, it was learned that McMahon had suffered a lacerated kidney on the hit for Pykel. The Bears quarterback spent the next two weeks in the hospital and missed the rest of the season. In the end, three quarterbacks suffered a broken thumb, a lacerated kidney, a blown out knee, and at least one concussion. After the final whistle, Bears coach Mike Dicka, a man who'd inflict untold pain during his own NFL career, said that the showdown between the Bears and the Raiders was the most brutal football game he'd ever watched. According to Sports Illustrated's Curry Patrick, legendary Raiders owner Al Davis was actually seen covering his face with his hands during the game. Of course, the following year, the Bears would go 15-1 during the regular season before trouncing the New England Patriots in Super Bowl XX. They were the NFL's new superpower. The Raiders, their dynasty was over. Three years later, they went 5-10, and and Tom Flores got sacked. Five years after that violent heavyweight clash between the Bears and Raiders at Soldier Field, Mark Heisler of the Los Angeles Times perfectly summed up the game's legacy. Quote, In a single afternoon, Heisler wrote, you can watch two franchises' destinies passing. It's unlikely we'll ever see another game like this ever again.